This morning, kind of seems, the passage now seems a little bit like a down note, right? Uh, but we're going to be in Matthew 7, verses 1 through 12 again. And we've been going through the Sermon on the Mount. And uh, we've seen Jesus talking about the beliefs and practices of the Pharisees and the, the religious system of that day. Uh, particularly in the, in the last few uh, messages we looked at in chapter 6, he was dealing with, just for some context, he was dealing with their giving and prayer and fasting, how they viewed material things. And now coming into chapter 7, we, we kind of looked at this a little bit last week. Uh, he's talking about how we're supposed to view and deal with other people, our relationships with other people, and our view towards other people. And remember, he's comparing that and contrasting that with that religious system of the scribes and Pharisees. And so Matthew chapter 7, verses 1 through 12, we're going to focus on 1 through 6 this morning. But verses 1 through 12, Jesus says, Judge not that you be not judged. For with the judgment you pronounce, you'll be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Why do you see the speck in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that is in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye when there's a log in your own eye? You hypocrite. First, take the log out of your own eye. Then you'll see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. Do not give dogs what is holy, and do not throw your pearls before pigs, lest they trample them underfoot and turn to attack you. Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and the one who seeks finds, and the one who knocks will be opened. Or which one of you, if, he asks, if his son asks him for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, we'll give him a serpent. If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father, who is in heaven, give good things to those who ask him? So whatever you wish that others would do to you, do also to them. For this is the law and the prophets. And last week, we really focused in on just verse 1 and getting the context of what's going on and comparing it to some other places in Scripture, taking a kind of, I said, the on-ramp approach into chapter 7, verse 1, judge not that you be not judged. And we did that last week because, like we said, Matthew 7, 1 is probably one of the most well-known and most frequently quoted passages of Scripture in our culture today. And it's also probably one of the most misquoted. It's used frequently and it's often used wrongly. And so we looked at that and, and we talked about the difference in passing judgment and making a judgment. And how people want to take Matthew 7, this chapter, particularly verse 1, and the, the, or the story today of the plank and the speck, and they want, to, they want to use that against other people and against believers to say, you can't be discerning about anything. Uh, they, they want to, you, you, you try to call sin, sin, or you try to uh, hold another brother or sister accountable, even within Christian circles, and they want to go here and say, oh, judge not, right? You can't judge me. We spent quite a bit of time in that last week. We looked at Romans 14 to get this bigger picture of what it means to pass judgment versus making a judgment. And we talked about the context of the Sermon on the Mount. We, we cannot forget that he's dealing with and the, the system and the teachings and the actions of the Pharisees and the scribes. In chapter 5, the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount, verse 20, Jesus said, For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you'll never enter the kingdom of heaven. And so through the Sermon on the Mount, he, that's kind of one of the backdrops of the sermon. What Jesus is teaching, he's, he's bringing it and presenting it uh, as a comparison to the system of the scribes and Pharisees. Uh, they were full of pride. The Beatitudes talk about being humble. They're part of the worldly system of corruption and darkness. And Jesus says we're to be salt and light that prevents corruption and disperses darkness. They were the, denying God's word and establishing their own. And Jesus is reinforcing and, and emphasizing 
God's word. They were focused on external morality, appearing righteous on the outside. And Jesus says that God requires an internal morality. It's, it's a righteousness. It's about a change of your heart. Their worship, when he talks about giving and their fasting and their prayer, their worship even was about putting on a show on the outside for other people to see. And Jesus says the true worship is about your heart. In the end of chapter 6, we saw that they were wanting and focused on uh, uh, storing up and, and gathering up material things and earthly treasures. And Jesus said, store up treasures in heaven. And so that's the one of the backdrops. That's a major part of the context of the Sermon on the Mount is that he's dealing with the self-righteous hypocrisy of the scribes and Pharisees. And here he talks about their view and the way they dealt with other people. We talked about they're very prideful, so self-righteous, so self-focused, they couldn't help but condemn and judge everybody else. Uh, and so Jesus comes and uh, in verses, or chapter 7, he's going to address that. We, we talked about passing judgment. Right? And I'm trying to quickly give a little bit of recap, but it's not just making judgments that's forbidden. Right? We have to do that. We're going to see that today. But it's about passing judgment. Passing spiritual judgment on people. That's what they were doing. It was so wrong. They were saying that they were the standard. And if you don't meet their standard, then they could condemn you to hell. They would say, right, they're going to heaven because they're so good. And you're not because you're not as good as them. That's passing judgment. And the examples we gave were in our culture today. People, you know, they'll do the same thing. Uh, if you don't agree with them on something that they feel is right or they think is right. And, and so they'll pass judgment. You're, you're, you have that position. You think the way you think because you're just hateful. Because you're a bigot. Because you're uh, evil. Because you're mean. Because you're uncaring. But, you know, if you work those things, you'd surely agree with them. Right? We talked about how even in Christian circles, even in churches, and within Christianity, that same mindset comes up. That, that if you were actually spiritual, you'd be like us. And you'd do what our church does and and if you're not doing things the way we're doing, it's because you're spiritually dead. And I think of the picture of when Jesus says about the, the man who prayed and pounded his chest and said, thank God, thank you, God, that I'm not like these sinners versus the man who said, God, have mercy on me. And that's the idea of passing judgment. People that will say, well, thank you, Lord, for, for not letting me be a part of one of these other spiritually dead churches. Thanks for not letting me be like those people. And that's the passing judgment that Jesus is talking about. That's the way the Pharisees were. And so verses 1 through 6 this morning, he said, Judge not that you be not judged. For with the judgment you pronounce, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Why do you see the speck that is in your brother's eye, but do not notice the law that is in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye, when there is a log in your own eye, you hypocrite. First, take the log out of your own eye, and then you'll see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. And so we know when he says, judge not, verse 1, judge not that you be not judged, or that you not be judged, or lest you be judged, whatever your translation says. The idea there is about passing judgment. We've covered that last week. And so we can go on, judge not, be not judged, for with the measure of or for with the judgment you pronounce, you'll be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. And basically, Jesus is saying to the scribes and Pharisees in the religious system of that time, listen, what you're handing out is what you're going to get back. Right? You want to judge people spiritually, we need to understand that you're going to be judged the same way. You're accountable to the same thing. And some people will take that part, that, that passage, uh, for with the judgment you pronounce, You'll be judged with the measure you use. It will be measured to you. Some people want to say that all that means is that you know when you judge somebody else, they're going to judge you the same way. right? You measure something or you, you judge somebody by some measure, then they're going to use that same thing to measure you and judge you. And that's true. right? Typically, that's the way we are. That's the way things work. If uh, we're eating dinner with somebody and they've cooked supper and I say something about their cooking, which I seldom do, right? I eat about anything. But if then later we have them over for supper and I'm cooking 
they're going to be a little bit more likely to be critical and judge by cooking, right? Because however we judge other people is how they tend to judge us and vice versa. And so that is true, but there's uh, something more significant to what Jesus is saying. It's not just how we judge people is how people will judge us. And there's a few reasons we know that, right? We'll look at that in a minute. But we already saw in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5, 44, Jesus said, I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you so that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. And we're in 1 Timothy, in 1 Timothy chapter 2, Paul said, we should lead a peaceful and quiet life, godly and dignified in every way. This is good and pleasing in the sight of God our Savior, who desires all people to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. And so it is true in a general sense that how we judge and measure other people, they're going to judge and measure us, and how people measure and judge us, we're going to judge and measure them. But for believers, we're not supposed to treat people the way we treat them based on the way they treat us, right? That's what he said in Matthew 5, 44. Love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you so that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. As a believer, right, how I treat you isn't supposed to be based on how you treat me. It's supposed to be based on who my Heavenly Father is Amen. and what pleases Him. Amen. And so there's some more to what Jesus is saying here than just how we treat each other. There's, a, there's another level to that. Paul even writes to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, uh, verse 3, verse 2, somewhere in the beginning of chapter 4. But Paul says to the Corinthians, it's really a small thing. It's really a small thing how you judge me. It is a small thing that how I would be judged by you. And, and the point Paul's making is that for him, what they thought of him was really a, uh, not a big issue. He didn't put a lot of stock into what they thought of him. Uh, the point he's making and, and the idea of, of Matthew 5, 44, how we treat our enemies, if we love them and we're praying for them, it's certainly not because they're so nice to us. They're our enemies. And Paul says that about leading a quiet, peaceful life. It was after praying for leaders. And their leader, that's in First Timothy, was Nero, who wasn't very kind of a leader. And Paul says to the Corinthians, it's a small thing what you think of me or how you judge me. And the idea is that the way other people think of me, especially for, for me as a believer, Jesus said in Matthew 5, to be sons of your Father in heaven, how you treat me shouldn't really affect that much. The way you think of me shouldn't be a major uh, part of how I behave and how I live and what I do. Realistically, right, what God thinks about me, what God thinks about my actions, what God has said, should be what's more important to me and how I live and act and speak. And so uh, I think there's a lot more to judge not that you be not judged. But with the judgment you pronounce, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. I, I think there's a layer there beyond just how we treat each other. I, I would say you can read it this way. For with the judgment you pronounce, you'll be judged by God. And with the measure you use, God will use it to measure you. And remember, he's talking to the scribes and Pharisees, right? And so who are the scribes and Pharisees? Well, they're the teachers of the law. They're the, supposed to be the keepers of the law. They thought that they were keeping it so perfectly and they would go around and judge everybody else by this law. And Jesus is saying, listen, you're going to be judged by that same law. You don't get to step out and say, well, we keep the law so perfectly, so that means we get to judge everybody else's keeping of the law. Because as he showed them through chapter 5 and 6, they're not keeping the law. They're doing all this external stuff, but they're not keeping it either. He says, you're just as accountable to the law of God as the people that you're judging. And so the idea there is that you want to judge everybody according to the law, but you're going to be judged by that same law. And the other thing to keep in mind is this. They, they should know better, right? They're the ones who knew it and studied it. That's why he says over and over to them in the Gospels, have you not read? I've said that a bunch. You know, he's not just literally, he's not seriously asking them a question. Have you guys read this? Right? He's being sarcastic. He's basically saying, you of all people should know. Amen. He uses some sarcasm and satire here in this today that we're going to read. But, but, but Jesus 
is saying, you should know you're the keepers of the law. You're the ones who study the law. You're the ones who've been teaching people the law. So you, of all people, ought to know that you're going to be held accountable to that same law. Amen. You're going to be held to that. And it's the idea of this. Listen, if you know, and you you know enough about it, you can judge other people, then you shouldn't have any problem being held to that same standard, right? And think about it if it was something else. Like uh, the example I wrote down here is if it was welding. Now, I don't know much about welding. And I don't know if any of you know much about welding. I'm not a great welder. I can dirt dauber stuff together so it won't fall apart. Uh, I can clod enough stuff on a trailer to get where I'm going, and then I might have to clod some stuff on there again to get back. <laughs> I don't know very much about welding. But if you're taking a welding test, and you go in and you're welding, and they want you to lay down a bead, right, weld something together, and the person that's judging your welding test said, well, that's not a good weld, you're not doing that right. And you said, well, here, can you show me how to do it? Well, they're the one judging the test, right? You would expect that they could lay down a really nice bead when they're welding. And if you said, well, you're the one judging the test, can you show me what I'm doing wrong? And if they welded and it was worse than yours, <laughs> you'd think, how, how are you qualified to give this test? Right? Or if you said, can you show me what I'm doing wrong? And they said, well, I don't know nothing about welding. Right? You, if they're the one that is judging the test, then they should be the better at it than you. They should be great at it, right? And that's kind of what Jesus is saying. If you think that you're so good that you can go around judging everybody else, then you should have no problem with me comparing you to this standard. Which he already did in chapter 5. It shows them that they fall short of that. They, they don't, they're not able to do it. But the idea is, of anybody, they should know better. He says, you claim to be experts. You think you're the perfect example of this. And so let's see how you measure up. We have already done that, and you didn't do so well. But the idea is that they should know better. This principles throughout Scripture. Luke chapter 12. Luke chapter 12, verses 47 and 48. Jesus is talking about the two servants. And he says, the servant who knew his master's will but did not get ready or act according to his will, will receive a severe beating. But the one who did not know and did what deserved the beating will receive a lighter beating. Why? Because everyone to whom much is given of him, much will be required. And from him to whom they entrusted much, they will demand the more. That's kind of what Jesus is saying to the scribes and Pharisees. Listen, these people that you're teaching, you're teaching them the law. They can't read it. They don't have access to it. But you're the guys who should know better. You study it all the time. And you've been given a great responsibility when it comes to the law of God. And to whom much is given, much is required. And you're going to be judged by the same standard. The, the writer of Hebrews talks about the same thing. He talks about if we trample the Son of God and we profane the blood of the covenant, we reject the fullness of the gospel. He, he talks about having the knowledge uh, of the truth and rejecting it and essentially says if you do that, there's going to be a hell is going to be hotter for you. There's going to be greater punishment. Hebrews 10, verses 26 through 31. The writer of Hebrews says, For if we go on sinning deliberately, after receiving the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, but a fearful expectation of judgment and a fury of fire that will consume the adversaries. Anyone who has set aside the law of Moses dies without mercy on the evidence of two or three witnesses. How much worse punishment do you think will be deserved by the one who has trampled underfoot the Son of God? and has profaned the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified and has outraged the spirit of grace. For we know him who said, vengeance is mine, I will repay. And again, the Lord will judge his people. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of a living God. And so Jesus is wanting them to understand that they're gonna be judged by that standard, but the reason is this, they're the ones who've been given the law. They're the ones who are supposed to be keeping the law and teaching the law. That they have, uh, they've been given much, and so much is going to be required of them. 
And, and the same language that the Hebrew writer uses, is, writer of Hebrews uses, is what we see in the story about the pigs and the dogs that Jesus uses in a minute. He talks about being trampled underfoot, right? The writer of Hebrews says that they've trampled underfoot the Son of God, they've profaned the blood of the covenant. Uh, he says, sitting deliberately after receiving the knowledge of the truth. And Jesus has just shown them in chapters 5 and 6 that they have the law, but they're not using it right. They're ignoring parts of it. They're twisting it and making it what they want to make it. And he says, listen, you're holding everyone else to the standard of the law, and you don't need it either. And you're going to be judged by that same standard of righteousness. And, and, and if anything, they're, they're going to have a little bit stricter judgment because they should know better. It's kind of like when you've got kids that are different ages. Right? I don't have a different standard for my children. I don't expect Addie to be a better one-year-old than Kinsley was. But today, right now, Kinsley is six, almost seven, and Addie's one. And so there are some things that Addie doesn't get in trouble for as severely as Kinsley if she did the same thing. Why? Because one of them six, and she should know better. Mm -hmm. Addie's not potty trained. Kinsley is. So our expectations for using the restroom are a little bit different because she should know better. And so that's what Jesus is telling these guys. If anybody should know better, it's you. And when you know better, there's a little bit more responsibility there. To whom much is given, much is required. Same idea in James chapter 4. Right? The more you know, the more knowledge you've received, the more you're responsible for. James 4 17 says, Whoever knows the right thing to do and fails to do it, for him it is sin. When you know what's right, but you don't do it, that's sin. If you know something's wrong, but you do it anyway, that's sin. So the more you know about God's standard, the more you know about the law. Paul says that in Romans 3, that with the law comes the knowledge of sin. The more you know about these things, right, the more you show your own guilt. The more evidence you give of your own guilt. Because when you know it and you ignore it, for he who knows the right thing to do and fails to do it for him it is sin. So Jesus is telling these guys, listen, you think that just because you know all this stuff, you think just because you know all this about the law that you get to see, sit in this judgment seat and judge everybody else. But listen, just knowing those things only shows your own guilt. Just knowing it only proves that you're guilty. Knowing it doesn't remove the responsibility. If anything, it increases your accountability and responsibility because you know. Knowing is just part of it, right? We've talked about that. Knowing is one thing, doing is another. You have to know something and also follow it. James says, be doers of the word, not hearers only. We've talked about that in Matthew. We talked about that in 1 Timothy. Right? Belief and behavior go together. And so the Pharisees thought that because of all this that they knew, they were superior to other people, and so they would pass spiritual judgment on them. But they had the wrong view of others. They thought they were exempt. And Jesus says there's not a double standard. There's not one standard for you and one standard for them. You're going to be judged according to the same standard as everybody else. And so for clarity's sake, and I want to move quickly, I'm not saying that knowing stuff's bad, right? It may come across that way to some people. Well, the less I know, the less I'm accountable for, right? But that's not Jesus' point. The idea is this, as believers, we should have a desire to know more and learn more and study more and be closer to God. But as we do those things, we become more aware of our own sinfulness. Mm -hmm. And we have more, it shows more evidence of our own sinfulness. But they had missed that. They were really convinced that they were given evidence of their own righteousness because they'd missed the point, right? Jesus takes it to the heart all the time. And he's done that in chapter 5 and chapter 6. And now in chapter 7, he says, so you know that standard we just applied to you that you don't measure up to? What makes you think that you can judge other people to that standard when you yourself don't need it? You're not the epitome of righteousness is what he wants them to understand. <coughs> Knowledge is only half of it. 
Again, Hebrews 10, 26. If we go on sinning deliberately after receiving the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, but a fearful expectation of judgment. To sin deliberately after receiving the knowledge of the truth. That means you know something. Now what are you going to do about it? And Jesus says they knew that they were misapplying and misviewing themselves. They had a bad view of other people. They thought they were up here and everyone else was down here. And Jesus says there's not a double standard. You don't get to go around passing out spiritual judgment because you're not above other people. If we do that, we say that we're kind of in God's position and other people are below us. But also, we have a bad view of ourselves. You know, it's similar, I would say, to the, the temptation to pass judgment and put yourself up on the spiritual high horse like the Pharisees. It really, it's the same principle that Satan tempted Eve with in the garden when he said, you'll be like God. It's this temptation to say, I'm above and better than other people. And that's what passing judgment is. I'm going to heaven because of how good I am. And you're not because you're not good enough. That's passing judgment. I'm not going to heaven because of how good I am. I'm going to heaven because of how good Christ is. And the same is true for you. But to pass judgment is to say, I've achieved something that you can't. And I've done it on my own. And so Jesus goes on to talk about this idea in verses 3 and 4, this uh, idea of self-righteousness. He says, Why do you see the speck that's in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that is in your own eye? How can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye when there's a log in your own eye? And the idea of speck in the, in the King James and maybe other translations, it says a moat. And we talked about this a little bit Wednesday night, different translations. This is an instance where I like that word better. Because a speck, we think of that maybe like a piece of sawdust. Right? And that's not the idea. It's, it's like having a splinter in your eye. Still pretty serious, right? I mean, having anything in your eye will drive you nuts. Yes. But a splinter, right? Some people say, oh, it's like having a little piece of dirt in your eye, and this guy has a tree sticking out of his head. No, it's still significant. It's a splinter. It's still a significant thing. And, and so a splinter would be very problematic. But the idea is there's a guy with a splinter in his eye, and he's miserable. I would be miserable about a splinter in my eye. Uh, and, and this other guy comes and says, hey, let me help you get that splinter out of your eye. And he's got one of those railroad cross ties sticking out of his eye socket. And Jesus is doing this. This is satire. Jesus is painting this very comical, ridiculous picture so that the Pharisees will see how ridiculous they're being. How ridiculous their self-righteousness is. This is like a Saturday cartoon in the newspaper, a caricature. It's satire, it's sarcastic. And he says, this guy has a splinter in his eye, and that's not good. But this other man that says, let me help you with that, has a cross tie sticking out of his eye socket. And so it's this very comical picture. You know, if I had a cross tie sticking out of my eye socket and you had a splinter in your eye, those things are like eight feet long. I couldn't even reach you to get the splinter because there's a cross tie in between us. Secondly, have you ever tried to move one of those things? I have, and I don't ever want to do it again. I was trying to be on the cheap side of things, and so I, there were some old cross ties, and I thought, well, instead of buying lumber, I'll use those for the legs of my deer stand, and that was miserable. <laughs> those things are heavy. Could you imagine having that sticking out of your eye socket? You, you couldn't walk over to the person to help them get the splinter out. Because it'd probably just be like, yeah. Yeah. You, couldn't, you, you couldn't pick it up. You couldn't move. Like, when you thought, here, let me help you with that. I can't move because of this big log, but let me help you with that. He's painting this ridiculous picture. And, and that's what he wants them to understand. He's really, it, it's the blind leading the blind. Mm -hmm. It's the blind leading the blind. There's a splinter in your eye. And if you've ever had anything in your eyes, you don't want to open them. It's hard. You know, I remember Kinsley when she was little, got a bunch of sand in her eyes at pre-K one time. And she was like two or three. And I had to take her to the doctors and wash it out. And getting her to the car and the truck and getting her in her car seat. And she wanted her cup and she wouldn't open her eyes to get anything out of hand. You, if anything's in your eye, you don't want to open your eye. So the splinter and the cross ties, the blind leading the blind. And people want to go back and forth on this. 
But Jesus' point is, right, it's about self-righteousness. Some people want to say the splinter is like this little insignificant sin and the cross ties this really big sin. And I've never had a splinter in my eye, but I don't think you, if that was you, you would consider that insignificant, right? Mm -hmm. I have had a fish hook in my eye. I fly fishing one time, and, and I was like nine, eight or nine, maybe ten. I was trying to be cool, and there was this Disney movie where it's Goofy. <coughs> it should have let me know, don't do that. Yeah. But Goofy's fly fishing, and he does the perfect cast. And so I was going to do the perfect cast. And so I'm like out there like nine years old, <laughs> and I went, Whoop! you know, right into my eyelid. And that was not insignificant, all right? So the splinters, I don't think it's insignificant. I think the point that Jesus is making is this. Self-righteousness doesn't see anything wrong in its own life. These guys were self-righteous. And so they didn't notice the cross tie in their own eye, but they noticed the splinter in everybody else's eye. It's not like an insignificant sin and a big sin. I think the principle is he's saying, you guys are going to go around noticing everybody else's faults, and you're overlooking your own faults. And your self-righteousness is a very significant thing. It's a, it's a very bad thing. And so how could you uh, help other people when you're not even willing to look at your own sin and be honest about your own sinfulness? That's the context here. Right? People who usually see everything, you know, they don't see anything wrong in their own life. They see everything else that's wrong in everybody else's life. That's who the Pharisees were. And so funny story about the fish hook in my eye thing. Similar analogy to Jesus' plank and splinter. Uh, that was like in the summer of 2000. Uh, was, I guess I've been nine years old. I got a fish hook in my eye. And my dad, like good dads do, said, we're not going to the doctor. I can get that out. <laughs> because he said, all the doctors are going to do is push it through and cut the barb off and charge me for it. I've got pliers here. <laughs> like dad award, right? So he did that. And then like all good dads do, gave me the story about being safe and not being dumb, right? And being careful outside and all that. And that same summer, just shortly after, he cut his own foot off with a chainsaw. Oh. And he gave me a lecture about being safe <laughs> and then cut his own leg off, right? They put it back on. But I was thinking about that, the fish hook in my eye, and kind of like, why are you talking about the fish hook in my eye when you got a chainsaw on your ankle? Yeah. But that's not insignificant. A splinter, a bishop, it's not about little sins and big sins. It's about ignoring your own sin and only focusing on other people's sins. And that's what the Pharisees were doing. They were self righteous. And when you're self righteous, you're not going to be able to help other people with their spiritual life because the cross tie in your eye, you can't reach them, you can't walk over there. You can point out and do all those things, but you're not going to actually be able to help them. Just like the person who is supposed to be given the welding test but doesn't even know how to weld. Right? And we all understand that. When somebody, you know, you know, you, you know people in your life that you've grown up around or people that you would think of as, as being very spiritual, godly people. And you'd have no problem with those people coming alongside and saying, I've noticed this and, and I'm, more, I'm concerned about this in your life and I want to help you with that. You take that differently from those people than the people who are doing all kinds of things and then want to get on to you for doing the same things they're doing. Right? And that's the idea. I can't really be a benefit and, and, and help other Jesus doesn't prohibit removing the splinter from your brother's eye. He says work on the log so that you can see clearly. And so that's the idea. When self-righteousness, I'm not going to be able to help other people because I'm not even working on myself. But when somebody in your life that you know is spiritual and is walking with Christ and they're a godly man or woman and they come alongside and say, listen, I'm concerned about this in your life. I, I, I want to I want to speak to you out, out of the heart of love, but I, I want to say some things that might be harsh. Like we talked about last week, right? How uh, there's the wounds of a friend or faithful. But when it's that person doing that, we take that differently than somebody who is uh, getting on to us for doing the same things we're doing. And so that's the idea. And the reality is, if you're really concerned about righteousness, that's why he says you hypocrite in verse 5. Take the log out so you can see clearly to take the speck out. 
if we're really concerned, because people will say that, well, I'm just concerned about righteousness and godliness. And that's the reason I, I point those things out in other people's lives, because I'm just so concerned about it, I want other people to do those things. Well, if you're really concerned about righteousness and godliness, then yes, part of that is holding brothers and sisters accountable and calling sin, sin. But if you're really concerned about righteousness and godliness and living a holy life, then the first place you're going to notice a need for improvement is going to be your own heart. Right? That's the closest to you. It's right under your nose. You're going to notice it, the need for improvement in yourself first. And so quickly people will say, well, I understand I'm not going to judge anybody else, and that's not the point. Right? It's about passing judgment, but we should make judgments. And so to say, well, I don't want to, I don't want to do any of that. I understand what you're saying. I just need to work on me only. Well, no, we see all through Scripture, church discipline, holding people accountable, uh, confronting a sinning brother. We have to do those things. And so to say, okay, I'm never going to, I'm never going to point out any other wrongdoing. I'm only, that's not what Jesus is saying, right? If we, if that were the case, that presents some dangerous things for believers. One danger that presents is that we would never uh, uh, confront a sinning brother or sister, which we're commanded to do. And if we never confront sin, then we're never going to remove the leaven from the lump, right? And if we never confront sin, then our churches, our church and other churches will become corrupt and increasingly corrupt because we don't want to confront sin because, you know, judge not, right? And our households will become increasingly corrupt and our families because we never want to point anything out and we never want to... So, you know, in, in, in the name of not being judgmental, I'm just going to let all kinds of wickedness go on around me. We can't do that. The other danger is we would end up in some kind of heresy, right? Because we'll say things like, well, well let's just not get into that. Well, that's a touchy subject. Well, let's avoid talking about that discussion. You know, let's just go along and get along. Whatever you say is fine with me. You know, we'll just let that slide. I don't want to speak up because, hey, judge not. And that's not what he's saying. That's dangerous. You can get into some kind of heresy that way because I don't want to ever question teaching, so I'll just, you know, eat up whatever's taught. We talked about that last week when we looked at Ephesians 4.14 as a, one of our cross-references. That's a very spiritually immature, childish thing to never do those things, to never distinguish truth from error, to never speak against falsehood. Ephesians 4.14 Paul writes, so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness, and deceitful schemes. And so if we never do those things, corruption comes in, our, our, our kids are influenced by things that we should have spoke up against, but we're afraid of being judgmental, right? Uh, things will come into the church that we should have put a stop to, but we didn't want to seem unkind. And so on the one hand, Right, we're, we're, we need to be working on ourselves. We need to be focusing on our own spiritual life. And, but at the same time, on the other hand, we have to be discerning. We have to be uh, able to discriminate between what's right and wrong. We have to be able to do those things. And we also have to realize that there's some people that are not going to listen no matter what. Right? There's some people that are not going to listen no matter what. And so these dangers of compromising and letting things slide and just never speaking up, Jesus addresses that in verse 6. Verse 6, Do not give dogs what is holy and do not throw your pearls before pigs, lest they trample them underfoot and turn to attack you. I want to do my best to move quickly on this verse. But when we talk about dogs in that time, these were not little lap dogs, right? This is not poodles. Okay? Um, personally, I think any dog under 30 pounds is a cat. But when Jesus talks about dogs, don't give dogs what is holy. These weren't tame, domesticated house dogs, okay? The idea of dogs is uh, these were wild dogs running around the cities. They're untamed, they're, they're just wild scavengers, uh, they're, they're rough dogs, they ate garbage, right? They would even eat people. If they had the chance, if you go and you see uh, the story about Jezebel, and Jezebel falls out into the street and the dogs ate it, right? The, the dogs were not 
uh, anything like when we think about dogs. They're kind of probably more like wolf packs in a sense, right? Wild, uh, 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 rough, scavenging dogs. And so they, they weren't like what we think about. They're nasty, they're unclean. And so who would throw holy things to the dogs? He says, don't give the dogs what is holy. And so there's these street scavenging, wild, mangy, mean dogs. And then the holy things, what does he mean by that? Don't give dogs what is holy. Well, uh, the, the best thing I can understand from this is if you look at the temple sacrifices, right? You go, you present a sacrifice to the Lord. Part of it you could take home. Part of it went to the priest for his meal, and part of it stayed on the altar. And so the part that stayed on the altar was for God. And God would consume that, right? And they'd give fire or different things would come and consume that. And whatever was left, if there's bones left, anything like that left, you don't throw that out to the street dogs. Whatever I take home and I eat, sure, I can throw my scraps out. That's not a holy thing. Whatever the priest eats, for his meal. Maybe he could throw that out. That's not a holy thing. But the part of that sacrifice that was offered to God is holy. And so you don't take what's left from that and throw it into the street. You have to be discerning. You have to realize there's some significance to that because that was offered to God on the altar. Mm -hmm. you, don't, you don't throw holy things that were offered to God out into the street for the dogs to eat. And so Jesus says, listen, everybody knows that. You don't, you don't give dogs what's holy. And the people of the time would have understood this. You don't give dogs the holy part of a sacrifice. And the point is, you better be discerning. He's not saying, just throw your hands up and accept whatever and never ever make any judgments. you got to be discerning. Understand what's holy. Understand what's okay to feed to the street dogs and what's not. Understand, there are some people that are going to hear what you're saying and they're going to see what you're doing and they'll just respond to that. But there are other people who don't. So don't waste precious holy things on those people who only want to tear it up and mistreat it and never give it a second thought to how significant it is. Same idea, do not throw your pearls before pigs lest they trample them underfoot and turn to attack you. I don't, again, pigs, filthy. Especially to the Jewish culture, pigs were an unclean animal. They're, they're, they don't understand the value of a pearl. They don't realize the preciousness of a pearl. And in that day especially, pearls were very valuable, very expensive. It's hard to get pearls back then. Uh, and, and so it would take a whole lot uh, of work to save up to buy just one pearl. And so pearls were very precious. And Jesus says, you wouldn't throw something as precious to a pearl to a pig. The pig doesn't understand the value of a pearl. They can't appreciate a pearl. They'll trample it underfoot. They might turn and attack you. You know, I don't know if you've ever seen an angry hog or made a hog upset. But they can be pretty intimidating. Right? Kevin and them, they have a domestic pig. Uh, and I've heard she can get, well, domestic, I use the word domestic loosely. Yeah, yeah. Not a wild hog. But they've talked about she can be kind of mean, right? And think about throwing pearls to hogs. They, they don't understand the value of that. And if you've ever been around a, a, an upset hog, they'll turn and attack you. They'll just trample it. They don't recognize the value of it. He says, you know, that, that, you, don't, you don't do those things. And we'll think, well, who would do that? Nobody would give something so precious to a bunch of hogs. And that's exactly the point, right? This is satirical. He's saying you wouldn't give pearls to pigs. And so why do you give precious uh, things? Why do, you, why do you present the gospel and, and do these things to people over and over again who want to trample it underfoot? Why do you give people the opportunity over and over again to speak bad about and mock Christ? Like the writer of Hebrews, who trample underfoot and they blaspheme the blood of the covenant. Hogs were nasty, right? That's where the demons went and came out of the man in the graveyard. When Jesus talks about the prodigal son to give a description of how low that man had gone in that society, he talks about him living with and eating with the pigs. No one would throw a pearl to a pig. And that's what Jesus wants them to understand. That, that dogs and pigs don't appreciate or understand holy and precious things. And unspiritual people don't appreciate or understand spiritual things. We have to be discerning. We have to make some judgments on what's holy and precious and who the dogs and the pigs are. And we have to make a decision and make some judgments about that so that we're not giving them what's holy 
and we're not casting them what's precious so that they can trample it and mistreat it. Paul says that about the Corinthians, right? He said that he didn't speak to them about some things. There's some things he didn't talk to them about because they were so worldly and so carnal that he says it would have been a waste of his time because they couldn't have understood the spiritual things he wanted to talk to them about. We have to be discriminating. We have to understand who the dogs and the hogs are. And I would say that's people that are false prophets, false teachers, those who follow false teaching, people who have been given the truth over and over and continually reject it. They continually reject it and return to their own filth and their own mud. Right? Proverbs says the dog returns to its vomit and a pig returns to the muck or the mire. They've been presented the truth. They, they've been presented these things. They have the knowledge of these things and they continue to return to the darkness and the muck and the filth. You can take a dog in the house and feed it great, great food. Some of you maybe do that. You buy really expensive food for your dog and then it goes outside and eats grass and throws it up. You got a hundred dollar bag of dog food in the house and that dog wants to eat throw up. You have a pig, you can wash it and pretty it up. Adrian used to do showing cows and stuff and they'd have to shampoo and pretty those animals up, those guys that showed pigs. And they'd do all that work. And they, the pig guys, from what I remember, tried to do it right before it was time to show because you can't get that pig ready to go show and then put it back in this little pan and wait because all that work you need to clean it up is going to be no good. It goes right back to the mud and the mire. And there are people like that. We'll, we'll present the gospel. We'll share those things. We'll show them those things. And it doesn't matter. They don't appreciate it. They don't care for it. And they're going to continually return to the darkness like a dog returns to its vomit and a pig returns to the muck because they prefer it. They prefer the darkness over the light. They prefer their system over the truth. They prefer their way of thinking over what God has said. And so we're not passing spiritual judgment on them, but we do have to make some judgments so that we don't cast precious things and allow them to be mistreated and mocked and trampled underfoot. We said last week in 2 John, he talks about a false teacher comes to your door, don't welcome him in and wish him well and all that. And so we, we, have a, we have a dilemma, and this is why this is such a hard passage that I've wrestled so much with presenting, because we do have a dilemma there, because our initial, our first thought is, well, what about that person's soul? Shouldn't I continue to present the gospel to them? Shouldn't I continue to love them and care about them and want them to see the truth? Yes, but that doesn't mean I have to give them opportunity to mock my Savior and, and, and mistreat the gospel and blaspheme the blood of the covenant. Amen. And, and so that's the idea there. You don't have to say everything to everybody. Like Paul, I didn't talk to you about some things because you wouldn't have understood you're too carnal because of the Corinthians. And the idea is we have something precious, we have something holy. We don't let people trample it for the sake of let's find some common ground or let's get along to get let's go along to get along. Let's find a neutral area. And at doing that, we do it at the detriment of the truth of the gospel. We compromise on the truth in order to meet people in the middle. And when we do that, we're allowing the, the, the holy things of God, the precious pearl of the gospel, to be trampled underfoot. Jesus says, don't do that. Don't do that. And so this morning, I, I'll wrap this up. Again, this is something we wrestle with. It's, it's a strange passage because I feel like I have to over-explain what the difference is in making judgment and passing judgment because our culture, culture at large doesn't see a difference. They just say, judge not, judge not. But it's also a difficult passage sometimes to wrestle with and explain clearly because we do care about the souls of those people. But we have to realize the, the value, the preciousness of the gospel. And so listen, somebody can mistreat me in order for me to, to share the gospel with them. You know, they can talk bad about me, but I, I cannot be okay with, I should not be okay with watering down, trampling, pulling the gospel and the truth of God's word through the muck and the mud and, and the darkness just to try and get an audience with these people. Because a pig doesn't understand the value of a pearl. Something similar my grandpa always used to say, right? and I think goes along with this same idea Jesus is saying. This is like the Arkansas translation of this verse. Right? Don't wrestle with a pig 
because you both get muddy and the pig enjoys it. Some people just aren't going to understand some things. But I want to say this, as we think about evaluating and discerning ourselves in our own heart and our own life, for the believer, I think we have to ask ourselves, do we really want to be concerned about righteousness? Do we really want to live for Christ? Do we really want to grow and serve God? Are we really and truly committed to the truth? Do we really want to stand against error? Do we really want to correct falsehood? Do we really want to stand on and for the truth of the Word of God? And, and if we do, and I hope we do, we have to ask ourselves then, where do I start? Right? Where do I start? Where does that start? Where should that start? And the answer is my own heart. My own heart. That's why he says, take care of the cross time before you worry about your brother's splinter. It starts in my own heart. A change in my heart. But the other thing I'd say is, this morning if you're here and you're lost, you don't understand these things, it's confusing even more so than normal for you when we talk about passing judgment and spiritual judgment and all those things. I want you to understand the point of the Sermon on the Mount. What Jesus is doing it is addressing the standard of self-righteousness and legalism and work your way into heaven. And, and I want you to understand that, that that's what he's saying is you don't get to heaven because you've been good enough. Right? You don't, you don't get to heaven by being good enough. Jesus is pointing out to the Pharisees. They thought they were righteous. They thought they were going to heaven because of their own doing. And he's wanting them to understand. And he wants me and you to understand that you're not going to be good enough and you can't be good enough to save yourself. That only he can do that. Amen. Only he can do that. And so this morning for the believer, I would say the, 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 if nothing else, I want you to take away from this passage this morning. Uh, what I looked at in my own life when studying it out is, you know, I, I do think we have a responsibility to, to, to confront sin and to speak the truth and to confront error and to identify false teachings and falsehood. But, but that responsibility isn't something that's just outside of me. I have to do that in my own heart Amen. and my own life. And if you're lost this morning and, and you've never come to, to, to salvation, you never place your faith in Christ alone. Because that's the point. You can't get there on your own. You can't even get halfway there on your own. You're not good enough. But you're going to be judged, and he's the one who will pass out that spiritual judgment. We said that last week too. Right? That's appointed unto man once to die, and after this, there's judgment. And that's that spiritual judgment where God is going to declare whether you are righteous or not. And the only way to be declared righteous before God is by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. Amen. And if you've never come to Him and truly placed your faith in Him and Him only, not a prayer you said, not your baptism, not your church membership, not some you know uh, ability or gift that you have, those things don't save you. That would be self-righteousness. And that's what he's demolishing in the Sermon on the Mount. But if you come by grace alone, through faith alone, to him alone. Let's pray. Dear God, we want to thank you again for who you are and all you do for us. God, we thank you so much for your word that, that, Lord, we don't have to go around trying to figure out what the standard is, that you've presented it to us clearly in your word. And, Lord, we're also thankful that you've done it in such a way that we can understand that we are all in desperate need of redemption. That I'm not good enough on my own. That through the law comes the knowledge of sin and, and my recognition of needing a Savior. God, we're so thankful that your word makes those things abundantly clear. And Lord, we pray that, that each of us here that's a believer, that, that we would not have that mentality of the Pharisees, that we'd be fighting against the mentality to ignore the cross tie our eye and just go around pointing out the splinters and other people's. But God, that we would be working on ourselves, on our own sanctification, and be walking with you so, Lord, we could come alongside others and say, follow me as I follow Christ. That we would be beneficial and useful in the spiritual well-being and lives of others because we are working on our own spiritual life and well-being. But Lord, we pray for those that are lost and that are, that are sucked up in the the pig pens and the dog packs of the world, Lord, with the false teaching and, and they don't understand the preciousness of the truth of the gospel, Lord, that they'd be convicted and drawn out of those false systems of the world and false religions and all the different things out there, Lord, that tell them that they're good enough on their own, 
Lord, because we want them to understand that their good enough would never be good enough. But that only your son is good enough. And that they would come to him. And Lord, they'd understand that the way that they are, they're, they're, not, they're not perfect just how they are. Because they're a sinner and, and they need to be made perfect through the finished work of your son and justification and sanctification and future glorification through him. We pray these things in his holy and precious name. Amen. Amen.